So, you've got a taste for power and you don't mind trampling on the skulls of a few innocents to get what you want. Well, that's a good start. So what do you want now? Well, everything, of course. Not to worry. With this simple 10-step Game of Thrones guide to gaining power, we'll have you being held great leader before you can say genocide. Number one, keep it in the family. When you surround yourself with people you can trust to act for your benefit or agenda, it enables you to expand your own power base. Do this through nepotism and corruption, employing members of your own family and putting them in powerful positions wherever possible. This will create a monopoly on positions of power, with everyone reporting to you, working for the benefit of you and the advancement of you and your family. Look to great kings like Game of Thrones Joffrey Baratheon and House Lannister for inspiration. Now there is a house that knows all about keeping it in the family, whether that's killing your husband to put your son on the throne, or positioning yourself as queen regent until your other son born of incest comes of age. But be warned, remain vigilant for cracks within the wall you've built around yourself. There may be members of your own family working against you. Two, make the most of your assets. People in powerful positions will always find ways to abuse their privileges. It's a great way to get ahead. It's the same with money. If you're rich, you can use bribery to buy your way up the ladder or, like a certain Tywin Lannister, simply dazzle people into submission with the sheer amount of coin you have. You could even purchase yourself a marriage of convenience that would get you, I don't know, the title of queen perhaps? And who doesn't want to be queen? Look to Marjorie Tyrell for an example on how to do this well. She knew how to use her assets. It's easy, just focus on the title you want and really go for it. Be prepared to do anything, even have a threesome with your brother if needed. And don't let a little thing like switching sides of a war get in the way. After all, loyalty doesn't buy shiny bejeweled crowns, and who says turn clerks can't be made of expensive silk? Number three, conceal your true face. Yes, I mean both of them. One of the most effective ways to get what you want is to embroil yourself in a high stakes game of secrets and manipulation. Use the subtle art of manoeuvring and blackmail to ensure everyone around you is doing exactly what you want, whether they know they are or not, while at the same time never letting your own motives become clear. A great way to do this is to take a leaf from Varys and Littlefinger's book. The spider has an army of birds, spies he uses to bring him secrets of everyone around him, which he then uses to his own ends. And Littlefinger knows how to keep his true motives concealed, playing his hand so close to his chest, you never truly know whether you've unraveled enough to get to the real core of what he wants. And when no one knows what you want, no one can use it against you. But be warned, bolster your efforts with contingency planning, so take time to make a plan B, plan C, D and E all the way to Z. Remember, failing to plan is planning to fail. Number four, create an ideology to enshrine yourself in power. Throughout history, leaders have used, or in some case invented, complete ideologies to legitimize their power. It's a surefire way to get total buy-in to your flavor of authoritarianism. When someone believes in what you say so completely with no need for reason or logic, you can get them to do almost anything. A man who knows all about ideological extremist manipulation is leader of religious sect, the High Sparrow, who used his sparrows to create a militant faith army to amass considerable influence over the Iron Throne. Whether his devotion to the sect is genuine is irrelevant. What's clear is his ambition to obtain political power to enforce what he sees as the will of the gods on the populace, whether they know they want it or not. Number five. Don't forget the little people. Don't underestimate the willingness of people to forget the awful stuff you did to gain power when you offer them something nice. When Robert Baratheon took the throne from the Mad King through force, it put an end to a civil war and ended the reign of an insane leader who the people had come to fear. In times of political upheaval, it's a good bet that whoever puts an end to the unrest and restores peace of mind, no matter what side they're on, will ultimately gain the favor of the people and you have a solid grip on the power you fought so hard for when you have the favour of the people. Suddenly battles are forgotten, strife no longer exists, peace, food and wine are free flowing again and everything that happened yesterday is forgotten. 
So what does this teach us, my little budding Mussolinis? Don't be afraid to use force, because people have short memories, and yesterday's usurper is tomorrow's king. Number six, keep the military on side. There is a reason why political leaders across the globe also happen to be the heads of their respective military forces, and in most cases it's not because they earned their titles through military service. Dictators will not survive long if they don't have the military on side. Anyone serious about a long and enduring career in the game of snakes and ladders that is power play needs to either earn the loyalty of the military through your service or gain it through coercion. Perhaps now would be a good time to put to use some of the previous points in this guide. So let's take a little test. Write down what you would do and come back for the answers. Answer A. We could place someone loyal in the king's inner protection who could be ready to strike whenever needed, like Jamie Lannister when he used his position in the king's guard to kill the Mad King, making way for Robert Baratheon to ascend to the throne and his sister Cersei Lannister to become queen. Answer B. Perhaps we could use our wealth to promise land and riches to those who fight for us. Answer C. Or we could even acquire the darkest secrets of military generals and use those to force their loyalty. The choice is yours. Number seven, keep three steps ahead of your political enemies. The age old adage, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, is an adage for a reason. And this is an adage Cersei Lannister knows well. If we were to look for one shining example of how to outplay your political enemies, it's her. She has the grit to seize her chances when the opportunities present themselves and to exploit the weaknesses in her allies and enemies alike. Cersei is one of the great players in the game. She used Eddard Stark's honour against him and twisted her own brother Jaime's love for her to serve her own purpose. Her ability to outplay those around her is summed up in the moment she destroys the Sept with wildfire. In one move, she destroys all the enemies she has in King's Landing and watches over her victory, not caring about the many innocents who died alongside her rivals. I hope you're all taking notes. Number eight, create a common enemy and let the fear take hold. Start a war whenever your position as leader becomes insecure. Having generals in top political posts from point number six will be essential here. But importantly, wars and enemies can take on different guises. The thing they have in common, however, is the common enemy and widespread fear. Let's now take a look at how an expert spreads fear for some top takeaway tips. Melisandre is a red priestess of the Lord of Light, a deity that is not widely worshipped in Westeros and is shrouded in mystery, as is she. She claims to wield powerful magical abilities, particularly the power of prophecy, and begins to slowly spread the seed of her religion wherever she goes, gaining followers, loyalty, and with it power and awe. Now, are you paying attention? But it's not merely the use of an ideology and apparent magic that is employed here. A great weapon of the Red Priestess is fear. Her religion talks of an opposing deity to the Lord of Light, a god of darkness, fear and evil. She says the two gods are eternally at war, creating a common enemy for all. She uses this war and the fear of the coming of the dark deity to bring people over to her cause and uses it to justify the many despicable things she does in the name of the Lord of Light and the prevention of the rise of the dark. So simple, yet so inspiring. Number nine, control the narrative. One of the first actions of any aspiring tyrant should be to control the free flow of information because it plugs the potential channel for criticism. And as we all know, questions and criticism are bad. When Ned Stark found out that the heir to the Iron Throne, Joffrey Baratheon, was not in fact King Robert's son, but was the love child of an incestuous relationship between Cersei and her twin brother, Jaime, did Cersei sit back and let the little nugget of information work its way out into the public? No people, she did not. She moved to remove Robert from the throne and place her son there and Ned was swiftly imprisoned. Shrewd move, Cersei. But not only that, Cersei also had the foresight to ensure that any of Robert's bastard children that littered King's Landing, with their dark hair in complete contrast to Joffrey's own golden locks, how dare they, were found and killed. Now that's crisis management. Number 10, get yourself a cause. Of course, if all this seems like hard and, to be honest, risky work, and you could always find yourself a worthy cause, thereby inspiring people to follow you, 
to whatever end you choose. Daenerys Targaryen, Danny, Khaleesi, breaker of chains and mother of dragons. We would follow her to the end of the earth, wouldn't we? And that loyalty was hard won. Plus she had, you know, dragons. And if you can't get power with dragons, then I don't know what will get you power. Daenerys takes up cause after cause, no matter where she goes, from attempting to win back the Iron Throne to becoming a liberator of slaves. Daenerys was an initially timid and obedient youth. However, as time passed, she gathered confidence and followers, becoming a formidable woman. Another reason she won the love and loyalty of those around her. Of course, we all know how the TV version of events ended for this character, but the books have yet to be written. Whether Danny's path to power will be the one that will ultimately succeed is to be determined. One thing is for certain though, she went from nothing but a name and arguably gained more power than any other character. So that's it for this Game of Thrones guide to gaining power and keeping it. I hope you have been taking notes and found something useful to deploy in your own despotic rise to power. Until next time guys, happy plotting.